Thank you, Andy. So I'm here to uh, welcome my panelists here. Um, we're going to talk about the uh, Spark, past, present, and future, and uh, a lot of the, the success around these, this uh, ecosystem has a lot to do with the, uh, the people on this panel here. So why don't you guys go ahead and introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Martin Van Ryswick. I run engineering for Datastax, the company that uh, powers the Cassandra database. I'm George Matthew, I'm president and CEO of Altrix. Abhishek Mehta, founder and CEO of Truseda. Uh, Patrick Wendell, co-founder of Databricks and working on the Spark team at Databricks. So let's jump right in. Um, lo lots of things to talk about, but uh, first off, for a lot of people who are new to the Spark ecosystem and Spark world, there's always a question of whether or not uh, this is actually being used uh, in production by companies. So Patrick, you have a, probably a, one of the best perspectives on this. So who is using Spark and what for? Yeah, thanks. That's a great question, Ben. I think we'll try to keep our answers short given that we're sitting between people and their food. So um, let me just give a, a quick answer. Uh, one thing we focused on a lot of Databricks since we started the company and, and spun it out of the lab is to kind of keep our finger on the pulse of who's using Spark and for what and, and how many people are using it. Um, I'm happy to say that uh, up to this point, I think we've, we've categorized more than 500 uh, companies who are using Spark in production uh, in, in one way or another. So uh, given that it's an open source project, there's probably way more users than that out there. Um, but, but we've seen a lot of adoption in the last year. Now, where is it being adopted? I think um, one thing that we've been really happy with this to see uh, not only the early adopter industries like ad tech and you know silicon valley uh, uh, companies using spark but a real uh, expansion into traditional enterprises so i think if you just even look even at this conference you'll see financial services retailers pharmaceuticals a bunch of other uh, uh, types of industries and in our own customer base at databricks we also uh, we also see that do you guys also have uh, any insight as to uh, what type of people use Spark? Is it mostly data engineers, data scientists, or? Yeah, so when we created Spark, uh, we wanted to empower many different types of users. Um, I think uh, we definitely see a lot of data engineering ETL style use cases, um, but we also see sort of advanced analytics, statistical processing with uh, MLlib, stream processing with Spark SQL for kind of anomaly detection and stuff like this. So. The, the software itself have, has many APIs. We have different constituents and different types of users, and, and I think we see that, and, and other panelists can add on to that as well. So Martin, you guys also are, uh, serve a lot of enterprises uh, from the Cassandra perspective. So who is using Spark? Yeah, so we have a, a distribution of Cassandra called DataStacks Enterprise that has Spark built in, and we have a lot of customers on that who are doing everything from uh, Internet of Things, we have uh, British Gas as a company that, it, it, if you talk about going mainstream, it's not a tech company, it's an old school uh, utility, and they're doing a Nest-like thing in the UK where they want to collect data every six seconds, every four seconds from all the boilers and units that they, may, they have in people's homes and do analytics on it and do some predictive things like, I can tell you your boiler is going to blow up before you know your boiler is going to blow up, that kind of stuff. Um, we see a lot of fraud detection, banks, um, trying to, to bring the analysis in more real time. It's not okay just to do the analysis later and look at graphs of it, which is a great use case. But in their particular case, we're seeing people building apps right on top of, of this data that need to respond quickly. Someone is doing some clicking around on a website, and they're doing something they don't normally do. Maybe they start doing some wire transfers where normally I come in and just look at my uh, bank balance, and they want to detect that fraud and shut it off right away. So it's moving that analytics up to real time. Now, you guys also uh, are a key component of what a lot of people are now starting to call the Team Apache stack, which is Cassandra, Kafka, and Spark, right? So, uh, so there, I take it, there's a lot of uh, time series event data. A lot of time series event data. I think Cassandra started its probably biggest use case where people used it was for time series. So. Right, right. Um, so Abby, finance. Mm -hmm. uh, you must have a lot of uh, different uh, types of banks and financial services companies, right? So ranging from consumer applications to maybe uh, fraud detection mm -hmm. and things like that. So what, what are banks in particular excited about when it comes to Yeah, Spark? the most loved industry, at least in this city. So first of all, welcome to the right coast. 
for all my friends on the left coast. Uh, yeah. we, we, we love having you here. At this point, I think anything in interesting going on in the big data ecosystem is being done in Spark. It's no longer being done in the old trifecta of, of big data. And, and you're absolutely right, Ben. Um, it is a misnomer that Spark uh, or real-time capabilities uh, only add to things like capital markets and trading, which seemingly are you know, sub-sub-second uh, response times. At this point, everybody, to the point you made, um, everybody from consumer banking to cap markets and trading wants answers and intelligence delivered in the moment and very, very quickly. So we've seen applications of our software built completely in Spark for everything from delivering coupons on mobile phones uh, to you know, uh, risk decisions around fraud and AML that need to be uh, extremely quick. Um, so a very wide variety of use cases in financial services. So uh, I want to circle back to uh, this team Apache stack because I'm, uh, I'm also an organizer of a conference called Strata Plus Hadoop World. And uh, as part of that conference, I see a lot of proposals around um, uh, event data and time series. But it seems like, Martin, a lot of these applications are coming out of the DevOps world. Um, is that your? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, we see in the Cassandra world a lot of DevOps, right? So the, the age of the old DBA, um, not so applicable. It's folks who are, uh, in order to build the application, you have to understand a lot about the infrastructure in which it's running, that you're going to tailor how you actually develop based on the ops. You can't just build it and hand it over to someone in ops. So that, that merging of DevOps has definitely accelerated in that world. And so those folks who are doing that are up against all the problems of performance and latency and, uh, and, and are trying new things. And they create open source projects, use open source projects, and Apache, I think, has been instrumental in uh, making that go faster. So are you guys seeing, are these applications mostly around simple counts? So just counting the number of events, or are you seeing more uses of advanced analytics, particularly the capabilities that are now found in Spark? Oh, I definitely think um, we've been surprised at how quickly people are trying to do advanced analytics. Um, it's kind of a marriage of, uh, like the British Gas, uh, this guy took some data scientists who used to work for NASA. They implemented Spark on top of us to collect the data, but then they needed that extra bit of juice to figure out what other algorithms that they're really going to look for. We've seen healthcare, people instrumenting uh, intensive care units, doing Internet of Things from all those machines. And they need not only data scientists, but medical people who can devise uh, algorithms to try and look for things like uh, someone's getting sepsis or someone's going to go into shock before the doctors even notice. Right? So it's kind of this marriage of the DevOps cl collecting and processing the data with some domain expert who's going to add that, uh, that magic sauce. So George, obviously, Al I, if you guys aren't familiar with Alteryx, check out their website. They have a lot of customers. They have a conference, user conference coming up. That uh, I think over a thousand people are expected to attend. So you obviously cut across a lot of these verticals and industries. Yep. But uh, it's interesting. We talked, I think, almost nine months ago, and you guys were contemplating moving your stack, the Alteryx stack, from Hadoop to Spark, um, and you've done that. So can you give us a little story around why exactly you made that decision? Yeah, it seems yeah, like a sure. major decision you know, for it, a company. It was a major decision for us, Ben. I mean, we had a little bit of history, particularly when it came to advanced analytics and really working in and around R. And you know, if anyone who's kind of worked with R in the audience, you know, there is some real opportunity to be able to work with all the models that have been built for many, many years around R. But of course, the scale out component of R is actually quite brittle, right? You know, it, when you run out of memory in R, it just the whole thing blows up. So we looked at it in a number of ways, right? And one of the ways we looked at it about 18 months ago was how do we take R and start to scale it out using MapReduce, right? And you know, I think they say that there's like a uh, no, there's like really no reference to like hell in the Bible, right? And particularly in the Old Testament. But when we went down this path with R and MapReduce. That was uh, quite an interesting experience for us, right? To just see how fundamentally unready MapReduce was to introduce other kind of general purpose computing capabilities into it. So we had to look at another option, Ben. We had to be like, well, you know, how does this scale work in a way where we can introduce the R engine and figure out the scale out necessary without uh, being tied to MapReduce? And Spark for us was a great answer, right? Because we were able to, one, invest into the Spark community, two, be able to 
map a lot of the initial functions of what the scale out capabilities of Spark and MLlib were and put our wrappers around it. And really, you know, Shivram and Chris and some of the other team members that contributed to this have been working on it for basically the last year. And we see this being a fundamental way forward for R to scale very elegantly in a general purpose manner. But when, you, when we were uh, having these conversations, it seemed like Spark R was still pretty early. Yeah, that was nine months ago. And now yeah. it's, um, <laughs> you know, yeah. the, things move fast, right? As, as Patrick can allude to in anything in, in the Spark world. But nine months ago, this was a, you know, a little kernel in a few of our eyes. And we've been at it with the Daybreaks team and a few other contributors. And we're at a point where you know, we are feeling much stronger about where Spark R is, and you'll start to see some more announcements around it in the not too distant future. And, and, and the good thing about uh, what you guys do is it's actually uh, a tool for business analysts, so the fact that they're using R is actually hidden under the covers. Yeah, I think one of the challenges in, in most of the analytic communities that we're actually serving today is there's millions of users that are underserved, right? And a lot of the users that are underserved today have to rely on Excel as their primary work uh, tool. And, and ultimately, everyone who's in this audience that has worked with Excel knows that the moment you start to do things like data blending in Excel, it actually starts to be very, very brittle and fragile. Like, the moment you do a VLOOKUP in Excel, your model is not going to actually scale too tremendously. And this is where we think there's a great opportunity, right? There's an opportunity for the models to start small and scale very efficiently, both for the blending and the advanced analytical work. And really, that's what Altrix has really been doing in the space. So, Abby, you embarked on a similar journey. We did. Moving from Hadoop to Spark. But you, I think you probably started earlier than George. We did. Right? But uh, you're in finance. Uh, much more conservative industry. So tell us a little bit about your experience. Yeah, it was an interesting experience. Yeah. I want to take over from what you guys are talking about on DevOps. Yeah. What we've done quite well at Traceda, we build, as you know, we build business applications. Uh, and we're not building general purpose tools. And it was quite clear to us uh, a couple of years ago that um, if you're building an analytics application in today's market, that takes minutes or hours to, to return answers, you're dead. You know, you should, you should shut shop and, and go home. Um, as Rupert Murdoch said quite well, and I repeat, I, I don't know, he, I don't think he meant it for our industry, but he said, you know, big doesn't beat small anymore, no pun intended, uh, fast beats slow. Uh, and that's so true for everything all of, us, all of us do in our businesses. I think that was a primary driver you've seen. We've been very, very early on Spark. We were one of the first guys to certify our, our uh, platform on Spark simply because of the reason that any intelligent output that needs to be delivered to a business user to make money, to monetize intelligence or insight, has to be delivered in the moment. And you can't predict when the moment comes, so you've got to be ready for it. Um, secondly, you know, DevOps have become the Vikings of, our, of, of, of the tech community. You know? we, we watch what DevOps do very closely. Um, and thanks to all of us, um, you know, open source being such a juggernaut, um, things mature rather quickly in the ecosystem. I think it's uh, kudos to the Spark community. This room is packed, you know, it's, uh, it's standing room only. Um, big data is still a nascent trend. Hadoop is only, you know, a few, not even a decade old for now. And the maturity that the Spark community and Databricks coming into the picture and pushing it forward, the maturity they've shown happen in the last few months. You've been running it for, for three years, I think, uh, now. Um, I actually believe that it was just, it was a matter of time that when you have a distributed computing cluster with memory sitting in there, you know, which with, with Moore's law, prices going down, everything should be in, done in memory. And I think Spark's maturity makes it easier for companies like ours to do it. So we have seen, uh, starting with something like anti-money laundering, you know, we've been, we're talking about it later today, thanks uh, to the community, you know, and, this, and the team to help us out with it. Um, but anti-money laundering in a, as a service model, with the Databricks cloud, um, which may have seemed like a dream two years ago, probably was a dream two years ago. Um, we worked with Databricks and got it up and running in months. And I think that is truly the future. Um, all advanced analytics applications, just to re repeat myself, will be built in Spark. Uh, and the Spark ecosystem, uh, what I used to myself call the HDFS ecosystem uh, only a few years ago. Uh, and that's just simply because how fast the ecosystem moves. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of the things we do uh, 
if you think about it, it all comes down to how do we make better decisions, right? So right. Do, and are we going to use data and analysis or our intuition? I think a combination of the two, but I think having, having uh, uh, systems that can deliver uh, recommendations in a timely manner makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, Abby, where would you like to see Spark over the next, say, 6 to 12, 18 months? This is purely, a, this is the only time I become selfish. Yes. So it's, it's yeah, my yeah. selfish opinion. And uh, Patrick is right there. And Patrick is right here, yeah, so yeah. I'll, I'll take Patrick out for dinner tonight. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I think there are two things that are, as we uh, continue to push uh, our applications in the verticals we are strong in, uh, financial services, and we'll talk about that given we are in New York, and all retail, uh, I would put two things on the selfish part and one for the, for the larger ecosystem. I really would like to see, and I think a company got funded yesterday on Tachyon, um, my top two uh, uh, items on Spark progression are Tachyon and MLlib. Uh, we fundamentally believe that algorithms should be free. We have our own open source uh, uh, pro, uh, pro program called Ganith uh, on open sourcing our own algorithms. And I think MLlib will unleash a wave of innovation we have not seen for a very long time uh, in larger industries. Uh, I'm very excited about MLlib. I would love to hear from Patrick where it is. And then Tachyon, I, I do fundamentally believe that there is a better way for distributed file storage. Uh, and it's about time we start leveraging it. And um, those two will be my top selfish uh, uh, demands. On the larger demand, I think we will see a much bigger requirement for all um, uh, implementations of analytics for all of, our, all of our companies around security. Um, it still is early. It is very early. Um, we are in a lot of regulated industries like some of my peers are. We do advanced analytics delivering insight to customers. So we get hit with a lot more privacy and security constraints than some of my peers. And I think um, we would love to see in the next 12 months Spark probably, you know, assume, or the community around Spark, assume more of a leadership role on security, which remains nascent in the larger big data ecosystem as well. So, Patrick, hold off answering uh, some of Abby's uh, requests here. First, I want to turn to George, yep. who also uh, made a big, big bet on Spark. So, George, wh where would you like to see Spark in the next six well, to 12 months? Where Spark is today is pretty amazing, right? Because I remember when Jan and I sat down for like a coffee even 18 months ago, and you know, we were talking about where things were headed, and, and Jan was like, we're going to build a great SQL optimizer on Spark. And I was like, wow, that's, that's really needed, right? And it's amazing to see how much progress has been made in terms of really building an amazing SQL optimizer on Spark. So, so I think now that we've seen that, I think there's a number of things that we would love to you know, see in addition, and certainly some of the pieces that Altrix is contributing to. Abby, I totally agree, MLlib has a lot of opportunity in front of it. I mean, easily the next half a decade of being able to enrich the algorithms that are there, being able to provide statistical summaries, being able to make it more business user approachable. We took the angle of how do we wrap R right, around mm -hmm. MLlib functions, and that's a pretty important thing that we hope the entire community starts to embrace. And uh, I think there is a, a real opportunity when you get past the two that I mentioned, um, particularly going into the graph world. I mean, graph is something that has um, a potential opportunity to really, really blow up the Spark ecosystem, and I think it's still very, very early on today. So I'm going to let Patrick address some of these requests, but uh, yeah, I'm going to so throw in one thing. Done, which you, Patrick, yeah, I, I took care of it. Uh, I already did it. Uh, don't worry. I'm going to throw in one thing which you guys didn't uh, mention, which is actually the most popular component in Spark, as far as I can tell, is streaming. Of but, course. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Patrick, MLlib. We're assuming streaming is already done. Yeah. <laughs> Before yeah. this conference is over, yeah, it's yeah. working. <laughs> so Patrick, MLlib, uh, now we have this website on Spark packages. Is that an avenue for people to contribute to MLlib? Yeah, that, that is. And, and maybe I could comment just a little bit more generally on, on where we see Spark go in, in light of uh, some of the feedback. So, so I think one thing that's helpful to look at is, is what are the goals of the project and, and how do we define it? I, if you look back even uh, several years ago as we were starting Spark out of Berkeley, uh, we, we kind of defined three things that are still today on the Spark website. We want it to be fast, we want it to be easy to use, and we want to support a wide variety of, of programming models and, and types of problems. And I think uh, we, we have a lot more to do, but if you look at what we've accomplished even in the last two years since we started Databricks, I think we, we've 
we've achieved a, a fairly good amount towards that vision. And uh, if you hear today, you, know, you can just hear people talking about different types of applications they're building on Spark, and it's all over the place. Um, and it's everything from kind of ad hoc querying to these advanced analytics, machine learning uh, kind of things. So I think in terms of where we're going in the future, uh, some things we're really focused on are maybe moving the benchmark in terms of how we think about evaluating, how do you evaluate uh, ease of use of Spark? Is it comparing it to MapReduce? Well, that was what we did at the beginning, and, and I think we, we did a great job there. But maybe moving the, the benchmark to be even more rigorous and to, to kind of go away from comparing against a uh, Hadoop ecosystem uh, and, and having a much more ambitious target, which is something like make Spark as easy to use as a, a, a piece of single machine software I use for small data. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we're, we're really focused on. And, and also broadening the set of people who can use Spark through new APIs like the Data Frames API that, that don't require you to be someone familiar with distributed systems or data engineering. So that's kind of the broad strokes of, of what we're focused on in the community. And I, and I think you'll see a lot of growth of MLlib. MLlib didn't really even exist or barely existed one year ago from today. And now we're kind of the leading uh, machine learning analytics library in the big data space. So I'd expect more of the same and just and more growth in addition to trying to to accommodate new users. So, uh, so I think with MLlib, there's a couple of pieces, right? So there's the actual algorithms, which I think is great. It's mm -hmm. growing, but there's all these little utilities that you need to actually uh, do data science, right? So mm -hmm. from data munching to uh, uh, better better utilities for mm -hmm. NLP, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but even more generally, I mean, to, get, to even get data to a point where you can run a, a machine learning algorithm, there's a lot of steps in the pipeline. Correct. I mean, there's ETL, there's data munging, data integration, and then you know, downstream you have things like machine learning and, and ad hoc querying. We designed Spark to try and facilitate that entire end-to-end -end pipeline and to be a substrate for, for higher level applications just like you are all building. So, I think we've gotten a good way towards that vision, and there's still a lot more to do. And, and to, to accentuate the point, at Traceda, for our applications, that entire pipeline, we run it in Spark today. So everything from data ingestion to, you know, uh, to what we would call entity resolution, not, not matching data, but resolving the entities, and then building the cleanest, biggest, vastest uh, data asset that you can run algorithms on, we run the entire pipeline in Spark today. Uh, yeah, and even seeing the transformation going from Schema RDD into basically the data frame API, I mean, yep. there's a much more generalizable way of being able to solve problems in Spark uh, than ever was before. So, you know, I see this as the new DAG. I see this as, you know, something that you can actually bet the next decade of your analytical workloads on in a general purpose manner. So, Patrick, I'm not going to let you off the hook on that one item that Abby mentioned, which is security. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, security is an interesting problem. So I, I think it also goes to another point, which is kind of enterprise readiness mm -hmm. and all of the associated issues uh, around Spark. Our vision with Databricks Cloud was really to kind of solve these problems, provide an integrated environment with security and so forth. Um, I think that there's a lot to do, and in particular, making Spark secure in, in a wider array of environments for people who are writing embedded Spark applications. It's definitely something we're focused on in the next six, 12 months. I, I think we, we've come some ways. We have full integration with the Hadoop security stack uh, now, but that stack in and of itself is not perfect, so uh, there's more to do. So Martin, you guys have obviously taken Cassandra and made it an enterprise-ready system. So any advice to uh, Patrick as far as uh, helping Spark gain broader adoption in the enterprise? Raise lots of VC money and run. You're, yeah. the, you're the older cousin yeah. of the Spark right. community. Yeah. yeah, we've definitely seen the movie. So um, yeah. we, we've taken Cassandra over the last five years from uh, a wild and woolly open source project to something that uh, is used at some of the biggest companies in the world. And a lot of what has been already been mentioned is what people look for. When people want enterprise, what they want are kind of the meat and potatoes features of a platform and of a system. Uh, the, 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 the really cool groundbreaking functionality has got to be there, but they want it with a couple of basics. You need security. Uh, our team's uh, actually contributed some security code, some SSL, some Kerberos code. Um, there's another kind of security they're looking for. They're looking for job security. So that means that uh, you, you know, they, they've bet their company on you. You can't let them down. It's got to be up. It's got to be reliable. It's got to, um, it, it's got to be economical, all of those kind of things. There's a simplicity to it. You've got to make something that's also been mentioned, 
something that's complicated, you have to make simple. I always say that uh, you know, the, the folks who make car engines today, there's a lot of technology in that, and very, very few people who go to buy cars actually even know it. They look at the cup holder, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's okay. People want to only interact with complex things with a very simple interface, and that's hard to do. Um, and so that's important. Um, and uh, and just, just more of that, just thinking of how to scale it. Uh, we test Datastax Enterprise at 1,000 nodes every day. Under load, taking nodes in and out of the cluster, f injecting faults, putting um, read and write loads on it. That's the kind of thing um, that enterprises are going to quickly scale you up to. I, I, when we started with Cassandra, the average Cassandra cluster was 30, 40 nodes uh, three years ago when I started with the company. Um, we have many customers now running well over 1,000 nodes. So that happens to you quickly as you become uh, right. A, right. A, a chosen technology, and you've got to you got to be ready for it. So I'm going to spend the last few minutes just talk, having you guys talk about what you see are the, some of the key challenges still facing Spark. And I'm going to throw one out here for Patrick, uh, which is one of my pet peeves: documentation. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, it's I open think, source. It doesn't need documentation. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think in terms of making it easier, yeah. 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 just read the code. Yeah. 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 That's what I do. I read the code. Yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. So, I mean, I think for in terms of people actually deploying it, making it uh, operational, uh, but also even frankly, even some of the machine learning documentation can can use some inspiration from Scikit-Learn, which is a well-documented project, right? So anyway, so what, uh, so besides documentation, what other things are you uh, s sensing from the community? In terms of the future of Spark? No, there's just a ch key challenge. challenges right now. Yeah, so I, I think there's a few. So just to talk about documentation, another uh, um, element to that is, is just broader availability of information about Spark in terms of training, in terms of books. And, and I'm proud to say we, we did ship the Learning Spark book in partnership with O'Reilly. Uh, there's actually more Spark books in the pipeline for uh, O'Reilly. And, and that's a big part of just educating people about uh, how to use Spark with longer form content. And at Databricks, we're very focused on training as well. Um, other challenges, I, I would really just go back to what I said before. I think um, a, a vision I have for Spark is that kind of anyone can get up and running with Spark and get value out of it in the order of, of hours. Um, and, and that goes to having simpler APIs, uh, to having really nice integration with storage systems, and uh, a lot of useful third-party libraries that can just do what you want to do right out of the box. So, so I think these are some of the main focus areas and challenges I see. I want to add one to it. Uh, I think just talking to um, enterprise, large enterprises, and as I look back at this, and I think you were with me when we did the first Hadoop Summit and first Strata, right. uh, this moment reminds me very much of that. You know, there's an excitement here that uh, was there six years ago at, uh, at the first Strata. And um, th there's a big need for clarity uh, in the market. There's a lot of confusion today when we go out, uh, just thinking around, Spark has the potential to be way bigger. Um, than the Hadoop ecosystem ever was, because it, it truly should be the fabric that every application is built in. Um, there still remains a little bit of confusion, Patrick, around you know, um, support. Uh, and is it complementary or competing? And, and where does it fit? And we, I think we do a good job dispelling some of it, because I think the ultimate success of Spark is the same as Hadoop in a way. You, know, you stop talking about Hadoop and Spark. You just use the applications. And I think this community, all of us together, need to uh, can, can do a, everybody a favor in offering more clarity in the market as well. I don't know if you agree or not. Yeah, yeah I think so. I mean, I think we want Spark to work well in Hadoop environments, and, yeah. and that is a, a big space, and, and we're totally excited about working with Hadoop vendors and integrating. I do think Spark has a role to play in a life that's outside of the traditional Computer Hadoop groups. environments. We see a lot of people using Spark with data stacks, with, yep. uh, you know, with AWS, of course, Databricks Cloud. So I, I do hope that Spark transcends the, the Hadoop label. And I think to a large extent, we've done that. Agreed. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I had a long list of technical challenges, but I can't get to it right now. So I'll, we'll I'll just hit later. you up on a blog post. <laughs> yeah. So let's thank our panelists. <laughs>